Hey, podcast family. Today, I am so honored to be speaking with Dr. Maggie Abraham, a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist with a specialty certification in pediatric and adolescent gynecology. In this episode, we are covering the unique challenges and crucial aspects of youth gynecological health. Dr. Abraham's remarkable expertise offers an invaluable window into understanding and nurturing the well-being of the next generation. Her journey is not just a career, it's a passion. And her story is rooted in inspiration and dedication and has led her to open the GYN space, a unique physician practice that provides for the gynecological needs of children, adolescents, and young adults. In our conversation, we explore the landscape of puberty from the average age for various developmental milestones to the significance of a girl's first visit to the gynecologist. We discuss menstruation as a barometer of overall health and the fact that for adolescents, periods aren't just a repetition of the adult experience. Dr. Abraham guides us through what's considered normal for teenage periods and the signs that might indicate something beyond the typical range. We also delve into the critical aspects of tracking cycles to provide essential insights into a teenager's health. And for parents, Dr. Abraham shares invaluable strategies for effective conversations with teenagers about their reproductive health and well-being. We also address gynecological conditions that can affect teenagers and discuss what parents and teenagers should know about these conditions from PCOS to endometriosis. Dr. Abraham is full of compassion and expertise, and I could not have loved this conversation any more than I do. As always, thank you for being here with me each week, and if this episode was helpful for you, please share it with someone in your life who might need this information. You'll find Maggie on Instagram at the underscore G-Y-N underscore space, and me at Nicole M. Jardim, and we would love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Enjoy, and I will be back with you next week. Hi, Maggie. Thank you so, so much for being on the podcast with me. Oh, Nicole, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I am truly thrilled. Uh, I cannot wait for us to have this conversation because I, as I was just saying before we started recording, I had problems as a teenager and did not know who to go to or who to talk to. And as I was saying, it was so mortifying. And, uh, and so it's really just great to have a conversation with someone who has this specialty because not a lot of people know about pediatric and adolescent gynecology. Is that your experience too? It's sort of like a not well-known thing. Yeah, you've touched on on so many things just in that brief opening statement. But yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, we're kind of pediatric adolescent gynecologists are kind of like unicorns in the medical field. Um, And you're right. You know, I think what you just said will resonate with so many others out there that there's like a gap in reproductive care for adolescents and young adults and their needs commonly go unmet, unaddressed and sadly even unvoiced sometimes. And um, yeah, I think realizing that kind of was what led me into the specialty actually. Um, Yeah. I mean, yeah, I would love for you to talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, pediatric and adolescent gynecology is a subspecialty, a small subspecialty within the larger field of obstetrics and gynecology. So I trained as an obstetrician and gynecologist (laughs) and didn't even realize during my training that the subspecialty existed. And I think, you know, I hope that's changed (laughs) for the (laughs) the residents now, but um, Yeah. So it was actually as a young attending that I first got introduced to the field. So um, as young faculty at the University of Florida, um, I was kind of the point person for the referrals that will come in for adolescents. And I also staffed the student health center um, a half day a week, I think, back then. And I quickly realized, you know, just how many issues were unaddressed for years and you know the fear that built up around things and you know I think reproductive periods reproductive care you know it's stigmatized and a little taboo and um I, I think that's changing um which is great but I also um you know quickly became aware that some of these things were complicated but some things were pretty simple and could have been, you know, managed and treated so much earlier. And just the relief, the flood of relief that came over, you know, adolescence um, when I was like, oh, we can, you know, 
when we could address it and improve their lives and help them get back to doing all the activities that they enjoyed instead of them sort of managing their life. Like so many teenagers give up sports because their periods are pro- are problematic. They're flooding through, you know, um, flooding through things, staining their shorts and it's embarrassing or they've got horrible cramps or, or other things too. I mean, there's, there's a lot, <laughs> there's all the reproductive things that we deal with as adults, you know, that are also present in this, in this, you know, teen population. And, and it's hard, it's hard to develop the language and it's hard to bring it up. And um, I think as women, even from an early age, we just feel like, oh, you know, we shouldn't complain about our period and, and we should just push on through, even if it is sort of handicapping us to some degree. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how, and then there's obviously my own story to my own history. Oh, you've um, got to tell us. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know when to get me started, but I, I grew up in Ireland and so I thought it was an international thing. I, I thought, you know, people don't really talk about periods and it's just unique, you know, unique to my culture. But, you know, when I, when I practiced out here, I thought, oh no, this is a, a more perv- per- pervasive issue. And um, just, yeah, it really impacted me just to see people struggle with uh, reproductive issues and really not have them addressed. And even, you know, in my adult practice too, you know, with adults struggling with different things like endometriosis, PCOS, and ch- like um, charting back their symptoms to teen years and like having the penny drop and be like, wow. So, I mean, I really could have address this so much earlier um, and then save themselves so much, so, so much struggle and challenges along the way. Right. Um, So I think most people in the field of pediatric and adolescent gynecology feel really passionate about the work that we do, getting in there early, providing that education piece and building capacity for reproductive wellness across, you know, early so that, you know, positions them well throughout their reproductive years. Yes. I mean, there's so much of what you just shared there that resonates with me. And just thinking about the thousands of women I've had conversations with over the years who have obviously experienced so many issues from adolescence or from the very first period that they had. And feeling like they didn't get any of those issues addressed, oftentimes until they're in their late 20s, 30s, sometimes even later, and um, and sort of the cascade effect of all of those. There's such a snowball effect of all of those symptoms that show up as teenagers, as you know, um, and what that's done to them as adults. And, you know, so much could have been avoided. So I imagine that you, as a, the subset of, you know, pediatric gynecologists, you feel so strongly about this. It makes so much sense. I feel the same. I'm like, let's get in there. Let's figure yeah. this out. <laughs> yeah, it really is a privilege to get in there and, you know, to to enter into that space and, you know, provide some, some strategies and, and solutions. And, you know, just seeing them go um, from something be compromising their life to, you know, it no, no longer doing that and seeing them step into all the things, get back to all the things that they enjoy, right? It's super rewarding for sure. Um, yeah. And so I think that was the hook, like realizing that, oh my gosh, there's a huge gap here in care and then feeling just, you know, how appreciative parents and um, adolescents and those that care for them are um, when, when they find somebody who has expertise in that area that can kind of partner with them on that journey. And, um, you know, some things there's a cure and some things it's more like an ongoing management. And so setting that trajectory for their, for the whole of their reproductive life is it's like, it's so rewarding. It's a, it's a great place. Yeah. I I love what I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I I feel the same. Um, okay. So I feel like we're just going to go back <laughs> to puberty and maybe we can start <laughs> there. I know. Right. Fun times. Um, I know. I, right. I, yeah. I, and I Whoever feel like wants to relive puberty. 
I know. Oh my goodness. I think about those days. Wow. I'm still slightly traumatized. And actually when I talk to women, you know, in their thirties and forties, they're all still pretty traumatized too. So I know that we're all trying to work to change that. Uh, but, you know, I think about things like the average age for breast development and pubic hair growth and getting your first period. Do, do we have, do you have date numbers and ages for those kinds of things? I know it's kind of changing, um, maybe even a little dramatically, uh, at least based on what I have seen and read recently. Um, but do you have any information on that that you could share? Because I feel like it's so good to have just a baseline understanding of yeah. what these timeframes are for normal development. Yeah. yeah, of course, a general time frame, And yeah, puberty is a time of just tremendous change, right? Um, when you think about it, it actually kind of blows your mind how much physical change, but also how much emotional and mental changes also uh, happen in that time frame. And so the average age of menstruation actually hasn't changed a whole lot. That's still 12. Um, I think, you know, but it can occur, you know, nine to 15 years of age. It's sort of the, 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 the time frame, but that is, that's a big time frame, right? Yeah. I think if we see signs of puberty before the age of eight, that's a little bit of a red flag and something that needs to be evaluated further. And then if you're not seeing any signs of puberty in your, in your daughter, and I'm talking about girls, cause that's my frame of reference by the age of 13. So no, um, armpit hair, pubic hair, no breast development, you know, by 13, that's getting, that's getting late. So that also needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, no period by 15, that needs to be addressed, evaluated and, 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 and monitored. Um, and so that's sort of the general piece. I think if you, if as a parent, you feel like anything is going awry, you know, it's something, you know, young women should have their first reproductive age, a reproductive visit with their physician between the age of 13 and 15. So that's really important. That's a recommendation from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics. So it is something that, you know, there's been a big push in, in the world, in healthcare to, you know, um, to consider a period like a vital sign, just like your heart rate and your blood pressure. And especially in, in our younger population to make sure that questions are being asked to make sure that, well, firstly, periods are occurring and that puberty development is, is normal because getting your period is a sign of wellness, right? Um, and to address, to address it and to build, um, build awareness of how important periods are, right? Yes. And also how important it is to evaluate things if they're not progressing normally and if your period is is outside of the normal parameters. Right. Yes. My listeners are well-versed on the concept of periods being a vital sign. So I really Thank love you. that you speak about that I because I, I speak about this in my book a lot. It's the barometer of your overall health yes. type of thing. And I loved that in 2015, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists actually did that report talking about the, your period being a vital sign in, a, in if you're a girl or adolescent. And I obviously talk about it for all ages, but I just loved that because I feel like you said, right, that so many things are just overlooked in that decade before your 20s. And, uh, you know, and then what, and then of course they balloon into all kinds of bigger problems. So I, I just feel like that should be the approach that we take, right? That it is really, really important. And, and if there are problems, we should be looking into them. Right. And, and putting things in place. And yeah, you're right. Like awareness is the first thing, like our, our, our reproductive health and narrative starts early, but we really only start to consider it, I think, in many cases, much later, right? Like in our 20s, when we're thinking about other things, like maybe um, starting a family or, or, or it's, or we're finally, <laughs> we finally have some independence and we're seeing doctors independently of our families. And we're finally over dealing with, <laughs> you know, the period pieces that are, are struggles that we've had all through, you know, our earlier years, right. Maybe that's a factor too. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, bu building capacity 
early on is a big part, I think, of what pediatricians do and what pediatric adolescent gynecologists do, especially when it, as it relates to, you know, reproductive care and also, you know, positioning our, our teenagers for healthy sexual relationships later on in their lives, right? The right. two are, are quite connected. Um, like if we're ignoring our whole reproductive health, then we can't expect people to, to, to enter into to the other other pieces of adulthood later on, right? Very true. So you mentioned at the age range is about 13 to 15 to have your first uh, gynecological visit. Has that changed? I thought it was older for some reason. No, actually, I believe that recommendation came out in 2008. Oh, okay. A long time ago, but you know, and I think most of it is done by um, pediatricians. And okay. then I think if things are not developing, um, or if there's not developing, according to the timelines, right, or if something is a concern, that's kind of where gynecologists come in, in many cases, and in other cases, you know, parents are a little bit more proactive and they'll seek us out directly, either because they have their own personal narrative and they want something better for their for their child and they want these things addressed proactively because there are opportunities for prevention. Um, and then um, in, in other cases, just they've maybe seen an adult gynecologist who, who also feels actually maybe, or an endocrinologist, a pediatric endocrinologist who feels actually you need the input of a, of a gynecologist. And then I feel like when they come to us, they, they, they really leave our practice because they, they see that value of, of having that ongoing care. Um, and so, yeah, I think we'll often see see patients initially because they have a concern or an issue, and then they'll realize actually, you know, this is a valuable, um, valuable care. And and often, you know, I think a lot of older. Um, so I think you know, women in their twenties will often see a gynecologist as their primary care provider, right, and not necessarily see a a family medicine or an internal medicine physician in addition. And I think in in the world of pediatrics, they're often losing those older adolescents, right. And so sometimes we 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 fill that gap to some degree too, where they will start to see a gynecologist pretty consistently in those um, late adolescent years, if they're aware of us. And it always right. sort of blows my mind, like the, you know, that, that there's a lot of teenagers going without, without this, this care. And I think those that seek it, find it valuable. And um, yeah, that's just like a disparity, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, I, this is, you know, relatively new to me. I mean, I, I knew that you unicorns existed, but, um, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I think about that. You mentioned obviously like going between the ages of 13 and 15, but most people don't even realize that this specialty or the subspecialty exists. Yeah. So, uh, how does one even find, a or like an adolescent wow. gynecologist? Yeah. So I think within the field of obstetrics and gynecology, we've done a lot more to train our residents. There's a curriculum now that's part of residency um, programs, both in the world of pediatrics and in obstetrics and gynecology, to train people um, about the, the particular GYN care for the pediatric age population and the, the adolescent age population. So we've done some work there. We have an organization, the North American Society of Pediatric of um oh my god NASPAC the North American Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecologists um and it's a wonderful organization and so we have a national meeting in North America each year people come from all over the world but you can go to our website you can go to find at PAG doc and um they're listed in your state and then we and I think you know because there's about gosh, the number of training fellowship programs in pediatric and adolescent gynecology has expanded tremendously over the last few years. So now I think there's like a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist in most states, mm -hmm. um, if not um, more than one. Well, that's, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think. Uh, so I'm flagged by Alabama <laughs> and um, 
Georgia. And there's definitely a program in each of those states. And then there are some states still, I think, without. Um, but in most, or, you know, you can, a neighboring state will have one. But that's, you know, that's a long way to travel, right? So there's also within the field of pediatric, within the field of obstetrics and gynecologists, gynecology, some um, adult um, gynecologists are building out a foc focus practice designation within of pediatric and adolescent gynecology. So doing some additional training so they can also help fill that gap. So I think we're working hard to address the needs of, of our younger um, reproductive age population. And I think it's just going to continue to grow and evolve. I think it's an exciting time um, and, and, a, and a hopeful um, piece for the future just of I think the next generation are just going to have more and more services and resources to avail of. And I think that will just change, change the narrative, right? Oh yeah. Anyway, it's so it's changing so fast. It is really amazing to see. And actually that sort of brings me into the thing that I wanted to talk about next, which was um, you know, adolescents and teenagers periods look different to adult periods. And I would love to just talk a little bit about what's considered normal for teenage periods. Um, and, you know, when a parent or a caregiver should see a, a doctor like you, if they, you know, suspect something's not quite right. Yeah. So, you know, you're in the first year, you know, a period doesn't always, you know, regulate right off the bat, right? So in the first year, we ex in the first one to two years, you expect about four periods, and then it increases slowly over time. Um, but if, you know, periods are occurring more frequently than every 21 days, or if they're occurring, you know, more than 45 days apart, consistently and your your child's uh, first period was more than two years ago, then that is a little bit of a concern and something that probably needs to be addressed and, and evaluated further. So keeping a menstrual diary can be super helpful. It's a good way because our memory, right, is just not reliable. Um, and there's that recall piece. And so keeping a diary is really important. Just a little log if there's a concern, just to understand when periods are occurring, how long they're lasting. You know, if they're consistently lasting eight plus days, that's too long, right? Mm -hmm. If they're saturating a menstrual product within one to two hours consistently, that's flow that's too heavy. Passing large blood clots, waking up in the morning and bloodstained sheets, soiling through their clothes, having accidents, that sort of stuff, you know, that's not normal. And there are things, you, there are medicines you can take to help make that better. Pain, like cramp, your period cramps that are mild and not interfering with, you know, activities. Um, that, 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 that's not necessarily a, a concern, but something that is compromising their ability to do the things that they enjoy, missing school consistently every month, you know, not able to hang out, participate in activities, like hang out with their friends at the weekends, you know, things that you know your child would do. I went, I went through that. <laughs> they were feeling up to it, right? Yeah. So when you see your, your child missing out on, on things and a period compromising normal teenage life, like let's face it, teenage life is hard enough as is, you know, they are things that need to be addressed. And then, you know, there's also, um, and, and a, you know, there's also, um, you know, young women with developmental differences where, where the capacity for a period may be very different. And so those things, you know, quite commonly are reasons that we'll get sought out for help with with manipulating a period too. Um, I was going to say really quickly, it's, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say really quickly that it's so helpful for you to say all of this stuff, because when I think back to being a teenager and I'm curious what your experiences was too, but I, my mom had really terrible periods. So of course she just assumed that that was the norm and this is what we all went through. So of course, when I had terrible periods, that was the messaging that I got. And now I feel like it's shifted so, so much. I mean, I still think we have a lot of work to do, but I do just love that this message is out there that this, these things are not normal and you really do have to be tracking your cycle at this young age to see that 
you may have some issues going on. And also too, I know we'll get into this, like PCOS and endometriosis and various other conditions actually do happen at these ages. And mm -hmm. we need to we need to be looking into that as well. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, well, my doctor said that I'm too young for endometriosis or, you know, right. So I know it's crazy, right. but it's happening. And yes. so I feel like we're finally, you know, at this point where we're talking about this for, for girls who are younger, which is yeah. great. Yeah. I think when there's a gap in knowledge, sometimes we're inclined to say, oh, that doesn't happen, yes. but it, but it, it, it does. And I take care of many young women with, with endometriosis. And um, I, I did want to toggle back to something that you said, oh, I think it's, it slipped my mind, but there's something that you said just there that really um, oh, triggered, triggered me to want to say something in response. Oh, this is what it was. You know, I think this idea that, um, you know, you only need to see a gynecologist if you need birth control or that your child, you know, I think there might be a fear that if you're taking your, you know, when you're taking your pediatric age child to see a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist, you know, I think, you know, a parent, parents and caregivers aren't so concerned at that point because they're like, okay, nobody's going to judge me. Nobody's going to think my child is, is going to see a gynecologist because they're sexually active. But I think as a teenager, sometimes there's that reluctance that, oh, why did they, you only need to see a gynecologist if you need birth control or, you know, you're sexually active, but that's, <laughs> that, that is a piece of what we do, but it, we do so much more. Um, and I think there is that fear of, of, I think there's still that like that stigma, right? That I think we have to we have to debunk all that that and you know, just to, you know, clear the path for people to access the care that they need and right. feel like, you know, reproductive health care is is important um and 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 should get the attention it deserves. Um, and and I think there should be that medical rubber stamp, you know, saying, oh, okay, this is being checked and everything's progressing normally, or actually things are not, not progressing normally. Um, so understanding what the norms are is really important in the medical community and beyond, right? So parents have those, those pieces to advocate for their child's needs too. And, and that messaging is so important because when a parent tells us, oh, I had this too, and it's okay. Like teenagers don't want to they don't want to burden their parents in most cases, right? And they don't want to cause alarm and they don't want to make a fuss. And they want to, they want to feel capable, you know, they want to feel like, yeah, I can handle things too, you know, and they don't want to feel like it's a sign of weakness. And, you know, their peers aren't necessarily talking about their periods either, um, because it is still one of those things. I mean, there's privacy and there's taboo, and there's a line between the two that I think gets blurred. And so these are not commonplace discussions, even, you know, quite commonly, I'll have parents coming to me about like, when should I talk to my child about their period? And I'm, I, I feel like, you know, these conversations, they need to start early. There isn't a too early time. We should be talking about our bodies and developing normal language around that from an early age and learning um, to layer on that narrative over time. Like, thousands of small conversations as opposed to like one big large one, you know, when we feel like, oh, a period's about to come, you know? And so I think opening up those channels of dialogue and conversation are, are so important, right? Yeah. And freeing, I think freeing, right? I mean, I think about this all the time. I mean, we're going to say two things. The first is speaking on what you said earlier about parents, you know, moms, usually, obviously, I'm taking my daughter to the gynecologist to put her on birth control because she's having sex or she's going to be having sex or something like that. And so that that's sort of always the messaging I hear um, mm -hmm. around this, right? There's never really sort of a conversation around preemptively going to the gynecologist to just address any underlying issues or just even for your first visit, that kind of thing. So I always hear that. And then the second thing is what you were talking about with having these conversations with your children. I'm so curious what your thoughts are on 
having sort of age appropriate conversations from a really young age, because that's a lot of what of my friends do and women I talk to in my community, um, because obviously they talk about periods all day with me. (laughs) (laughs) So I just feel like there, you know, there's definitely a lot more openness now. I feel like we've, we've sort of shed the, the shame and the taboo feelings around periods to some degree, not all of us, but I think back to the conversations I've had with my mom and my aunts and they were all just mortified by their menstrual cycles and by their bodies in general. And there was zero conversation. And then of course, my mom described having to wear those pads that had a belt and it was a whole, you know, whole saga. Um, And so I just think back to these conversations with women who are just a generation ago And I think now, and, you know, I have a friend who is changing her menstrual cup in front of her two-year-old and she's like, mom, that's like a volcano, you know? And so like, there's a whole, lots of conversations happening now. I feel like that obviously did not just, did not happen even 20 years ago. Yeah. But I think there's so much reassurance in that modeling, right? So, I mean, you know, this may not, some of these things may not lend themselves well to every child, but I think giving parents permission, right. Mm -hmm. To have, you know, to, to answer your kids will ask questions in real time. And I think being thoughtful as parents about the behaviors we're modeling and the information that we're providing and giving them those little nuggets as they ask it, because, you know, when they ask, um, you know, when they get an answer, you know, it, they often, depending on the development, right, the, the developmental age, often, you know, they'll just want like a quick little answer and then they'll circle back with another little question. And then you also want to check their understanding, right? Um, and so I love, I love that it's like a volcano. <laughs> like my six-year-old like asks me all the time, like, do I, I have four kids, she's my youngest do I have to have a period one day? Because I don't want that. I don't want, like, I don't want blood coming out of me at, at all. Yeah, it's and, terrifying. Yeah. That's the thought. And, and, you know, I'm like, okay, well, we will, we'll get there when, <laughs> you know, and we have these little conversations and I'm like, well, what's scary about blood? And you start to build your understanding of, of, of your child. And it gives you the ability to sort of soothe their concerns and fears when, before ever they have to deal with it. Right. So when they eventually have to deal with it, you position them, right. You've equipped them. And I think that just takes a whole level, brings it all down to such a lower level of intensity. Right. And and so I think those early conversations are are important. And if there's somebody listening to this who feels like, oh, look, I I haven't had a conversation yet. Like it's never too late either. Um, just start where you're at and and you know, just be willing to to enter into that space with your child. And then it sort of positions you too to be their person, right? Then they're not going to go to the internet. Or if they do, they're going to do it, you know, equipped with with some fundamental knowledge, right? Or with you, you know, they're going to take you on that journey with them. And I think it just positions them just so much better. Um, And just in this era where the internet is becoming like the default education. um, And, and I think it's so important just to have the voice of a parent or guardian in that mix too, to help you know, to help make sure that they're, you know, to steward them through, you know, puberty, adolescence and all of that, because it's a lot, right? It's a time of tremendous growth and development. And and we need our parents as much as we think we don't. And as much as we act like we don't, we really do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you, you're going to want to be in that, in that place. And, you know, when they come back to you and ask those questions, it opens up so many other conversations too. Uh, and, you know, we know that during adolescence, it's the time where, where our kids do start to step away and build some of their own identity. But if you've already set the framework for being a voice of reason and knowledge, or we don't know the answers, but we'll figure it out. You know, that's so valuable, I think, to, uh, to a teen who's trying to 
figure out so much to know that they have like that auntie or that parent um, that they can go to um, yeah. to help, right? Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, that that's the problem, right? Is that we as adults tend to bring our own preconceived notions and our own baggage around menstrual cycles and bodies and how they work to these conversations where our kids or kids in general don't have any of this baggage around our bodies and cycles and blood and various other things. So of course, they're going to feel how we feel if we're scared or we're embarrassed or mortified to talk about this stuff. So I think that that's it, right? I'm always telling women, you have to literally remove all of your own stuff around your menstrual cycle and just have these open conversations because usually your child is going to be like, oh, that's cool. Okay. And then go on with their lives, right? I mean, that's that's how all of my friends have told me their kids respond. <laughs> right. They're not phased, not phased no. at all. Like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> Um, and then they sometimes get a little worried about bleeding and, you know, all that stuff. And and I, and that totally makes sense too. But I, I do think that it's, it's so hard to not be completely freaked out <laughs> when you're having these conversations, if you still have, you know, your own issues with, with your cycle. And I, I think so many of us do because we had such a traumatic puberty or traumatic first period experiences because we just weren't prepared. Right. And we didn't have strategy or even like forewarning, right? Right. Yes. You know, all the, like the changes of puberty happen so slowly, right? That I feel like, you know, parents are often surprised. They're like, they didn't have any breasts like a few months ago. And now we went through winter and it's summer. And now I'm like seeing them. You know what I mean? I think, but for the child who's going or the, you know, the, yeah, the child or, or young adolescent who's going through some of these changes, there is subtle, like a slow progression. And so things can kind of catch them by surprise if there isn't that anticipatory guidance, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's our role as parents, right? To prepare our, our kids as be the best way we can. That's, that's um, the goal. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, that is the goal. So can we talk a little bit about cycle tracking? I am obviously a huge oh. proponent of cycle tracking. I wish I had this data on my own cycle from when I was 12. It would be amazing. Uh, but alas, I do not. Um, and so I'm always jealous of the young girls now who get to track their cycles <laughs> at 12, 13, 14, because they're going to have all this information for their whole life. And so I'm curious from you how you suggest that tweens and teens track their cycles and what do you think is most important for them to know? Yeah, yeah. So in early adolescence, or like your tween, um, I, I'm i a fan of pen and paper. So immensely. You are? Family. I am for a few reasons. Like I definitely think the app, like the menstrual app space has evolved tremendously. And I am so grateful for all the protections that they're putting in around privacy. And also, you know, I think a few have been really thoughtful about gearing some of their app content towards this younger population, right? Yes. Because, you know, they're not fertility tracking, right? So they don't need all of those those pieces. Um, but also just the the task of doing it on pen and paper, I think sometimes builds a, a, a better understanding. So for your, you know, an eight, nine year old, um, you know, eight year olds, gosh, that's, that's early puberty. That needs to be under medical evaluation too. But, um, you know, your nine, 10, 11 year old, you know, they're often going to want to do it in partnership with a parent. So pulling out a little menstrual diary, um, there are tons of them out there. There's one on my website that you can download for free. Um, and just helping them, um, mark it on the calendar, and then building some anticipatory guidance. Ah, so this is what we're going to do, you know, making sure they have like, you know, um, hygiene products in their backpack, you know, making sure that the school nurse knows they can get Tylenol or, or Motrin if they need it for cramps and knowing that they can go there, right, and do that. And also just, you know, on the upfront, knowing that, hey, if they're a little bit irritable, how I'm going to have a little bit more capacity as a parent to give them some margin and maybe creating like more rest 
best and, you know, just, just supporting them. Um, even if their period's very normal, right. And not that bothersome, they still need that little bit of extra TLC because, you know, it is a big change. And so I think pen and paper or, you know, track it on your calendar, just mark it on your, if they have an, a device, right. Or um, even in the note section. And then as they get older, yeah, apps are great. But at that point, they already, sometimes an app will just automatically program. And I've seen this cause alarm in some of my, my, my patients um, and automatically pro program them for a set cycle of 28 days. Right. right. And that, not be their cycle, anything from 21 days to 35. And somebody who's two years out from their first period is, is, is normal. Um, and so their period may be on the longer side. So building some of that, um, into it and then tracking like some of their symptoms too. So checking in with kind of cramps, checking in with emotions and feelings, um, all of those things are important, right? Because there's different phases to the menstrual cycle. And because those hormonal pieces are in flux, you know, that that translates into, into changes in, in how we're feeling and doing um, and understanding, you know, that maybe some of that is, affecting their their threshold for certain things right and so I think if they have that information they can use that to inform how they're doing their life you know um and I think you know their expectations of themselves too right because um you know we demand a lot of our bodies right but we don't always provide it the care that it needs. So making sure that they're sleeping well, eating well, hydrating well, all of those things are so important. And I think if they have some of that anticipatory knowledge, it's helpful. And then, you know, if they're missing periods for months on end, you know, that's, that's really important information too. Sometimes it can be as simple as, well, here I've shifted this, that, or the other in my life, or there's been a, a big stressor. Um, and that can explain it, but also just taking stock of it. And other times it can be a sign that something is, is, is not functioning well with their reproductive system independently of, of the other factors that are going on in life. So I think all of it's really important and it kind of brings their reproductive tracking their periods, gives them, um, an opportunity to, to address their healthcare needs, reproductive healthcare needs on the early side, right? Cause it, it kind of highlights some, some problems as they're emerging, as opposed to kind of dealing with it later on when, when things are a little bit more set, because for example, just, you know, pelvic pain, you know, if you're getting reinforcement of severe menstrual cramps every single month that can, you know, progress from pain every single month for a few days to constant pelvic pain. If over time, you know, you're not managing that pain well. Um, so simple things just like that, right. Um, it's well, I think it, it just goes such a long way in not normalizing all of these symptoms because for so long, I just think so much of them have been normalized. And then of course they're ignored ultimately. I mean, it's exactly what happened to me and so many others I've spoken to. So I, I, I love this. We, I think that that gynecologists advocating for cycle tracking is, is amazing. <laughs> we should absolutely be doing that. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, you know, I, I found out, or I found that, um, quite a few tweens and teens really like the Tina app. It's a, it's, it's a device. Yes. It's a, you take your temperature to, you know, find out when you're ovulating, uh, for like really more specific cycle tracking purposes, but also the app is so amazing because it has so much good information in it too. And I just, that's the thing, right? If I think, I think back, oh, if I'd only had something like this, it would have been amazing. Um, so for anyone, you know, maybe who's struggling to not, to get information, whether it's from a parent or a caregiver, I always think, oh, well, there's, you know, there's other options now, which is so great too. In addition to the pen and paper. I love that, by the way. I love yes. that you're so old school. <laughs> <laughs> I so am. Good. And I, yeah, and I definitely see the value of apps as well. And my older teens and uh, you know, definitely, you know, and the boats already sail there. They've pulled out their device in the office and we're just scrolling through and I'm just like, um, don't do that with them, but just making sure that sometimes they're turning off some of the features and understanding about yeah. their 
the C and making sure their, their health information is protected. Those things right. are important. And also I think, you know, sometimes ha- checking with a parent too, to make sure that they're, they're comfortable with it. Um, right. And it's helpful. It is really helpful because then, you know, they've got all this data all this health information and knowledge about how their body's functioning. And it's really great because sometimes you can look back at things and go, oh, well, a year ago, actually, things looked really great. And so, you know, often, you know, I feel like, you know, as adults, we're really good at pinpointing things where, you know, things that happened and how it affected us. And often adolescents, they just sort of, keep moving, right? And they don't actually realize that maybe they've undergone a tremendous amount of of stress and change. Like stress is your body's way of dealing with change, right? And so they are often not able to, they'll be like, no, like everything's the same as it was. And then we'll look a little bit more specifically and tease some things out. And then they'll realize, oh yeah, yeah, you know, that happened. And, and, you know, they're also able to frame it like, oh, it happened. And, you know, it's really successful. And then we're like, okay, but then it affected these other areas. And it's like understanding that their body works cohesively. Right. And so I think that, that I really appreciate apps from that standpoint that you can often get a lot more longitudinal data and it helps build a narrative. But I, I do, I will try. I will track back, but yeah, like I have young kids. So at 10, 11, I'm definitely more like, let's minimize, you know, anything yeah. electronic and try and do pen and paper. And then, you know, I think just the 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 physical act of it is just a little bit more mindful sometimes and, and helps them to take stock um, a little bit of what, what's going on in their body. Yeah. I mean, it's impressive right. that you advocate for this and you're able to get kids to do it. I think it's amazing, especially oh, now yeah. with everyone who has phones and apps and all the things. Um, so, you know, there's something that you have touched on repeatedly and it's sort of the abnormalities in, in teenage periods. And uh, I, I am curious from your perspective. So conditions like endometriosis, PCOS, you've also mentioned ovarian cysts. And, uh, and things like malarian anomalies, which I, I would love to talk about because nobody talks about these kinds of things. Um, can you talk a little bit about these conditions and you know, some of the symptoms that we should be really paying attention to as parents to you know, then maybe bring our children in to a doctor? Yeah. Because I think that that's like we talked about, it's just so ignored sometimes. We just think it's normal. Absolutely. And also, you know, young women with bleeding disorders, Yes. Uh, A huge, a huge gap there too. So I think, you know, if you've had a, a, if your child has had to go to the emergency room, for example, um, because of, of heavy flow or, or painful flow, I mean, then they have a significant period problem likely that needs to be evaluated further. Um, If your child has anemia, like a low hemoglobin, because there, that's a sign of excessive blood loss. And, you know, if they haven't had a, um, a long, if their history co- of developing anemia coincides with the, you know, with menstruation, then likely that's a good indicator too, that their period losses are excessive. You know, it's hard to quantify a period, right? Because, um, I mean, we have methods scientifically, but as a parent, right, it's hard. You're like, well, how much are they? But how much blood are they losing? And and kids can be kind of secretive too. Um, and a period, you know, is that that your your menstrual blood is filled with fluid and secretions as well as red blood cells. So you know, things like. Uh, menstrual cups make it a little bit easier to quantify, but most, most young teens are not using uh, menstrual cups, but if they're changing a pad or tampon within one to two hours consistently, if they're passing clots that are bigger than quarter sized, if they're soaking through their clothes, having nighttime bloody episodes or accidents, if it happens once, fair enough. But if it's happening consistently, that's a sign of flow that's too heavy. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, more than, you know, eight days of bleeding a month or is is considered on the heavy side too. So if those things are happening consistently, pain, you know, that's 
compromising their ability to do things that can be a sign heavy painful periods are the early signs of endometriosis right and so if if you're noticing that your period that your child's period is is compromising um them then get it checked out you know uh, definitely keep a menstrual diary so that you have some objective evidence I mean people will will come in and you know you'll see it in their faces like parents concern um but it is helpful to have some of these like like objective measures um commonly we'll check labs um often get an ultrasound another reason for um heavy periods is if the uterus is shaped differently. So if there's an anomaly, right? Um, and sometimes um, pain can also be caused by anomalies, especially if the uterus has um, is blocked on one side or something like that. There's a lot of complexity there. And it, it, it always surprises me that people quite commonly don't find out about these things until they're in their 20s. Um, yeah. And we could simply pick this up on an ultrasound earlier. Um, and ultrasounds in teen pop. The other concern is like the whole pelvic exam thing. You know, we can get so much information from history. Um, a menstrual diary, um, and also from um, from blood work and a transabdominal ultrasound, so an ultrasound done across the belly, right? And that's generally what we do. And then um, you mentioned PCOS, so certainly, so and just to I guess put things in um, a frame of reference, I suppose you know we we there's still a lot of um, research being done about how common bleeding disorders are that um, from the limited data that we do have, you know, up to a third of young women or teenagers who wind up in an emergency room for heavy menstrual bleeding will actually ultimately have an underlying bleeding tendency. Mm -hmm. So that's really high. And I feel like I mean, I feel like so many young young women wind up in the emergency room with a heavy period or anemia related to it because, you know, because that's been their only recourse, right, for care. Um, and it's, you know, um, so, and I think often there is a gap with that follow-up piece afterwards. Um, and so making sure that they're tested appropriately, and that's often done in conjunction with a hematologist, so that that information can inform their future care, right? Um, so I think that's important. If a parent has endometriosis and their daughter's having heavy painful periods, then there's a really high probability that that's, their daughter has it too, because there is a genetic factor there. Um, and young women who have you know, uh, heavy, painful periods that don't improve on a hormonal method. I mean, up two thirds plus of those will have it, of that group will have endometriosis. So really important that that's being proactively thought about um, and that we're thoughtful in their care, right? Um, and making sure that we're maximizing the treatment of their period so that they don't go on to develop some of the, um, some of the long-term consequences of, of poorly addressed endometriosis or unaddressed, right? Um, and then, um, what else did you mention? You mentioned a little bit about malaria and anomaly. So they are definitely rarer, um, but we, you know, when, when there aren't very many, we get patients from all over the state. So, um, we see a, a, a good amount. And some of those, you know, you just inform and counsel and, and some need a surgical management option. Can you explain and, that, um, what those are, what malaria and anomalies are? So it's know. where the uterus develops differently. So instead of getting your pear-shaped uterus, it can develop as a, a unicornuate uterus, a bicornuate uterus, a septate uterus. And there are a number of a variants even within some of that. Um, sometimes um, you might have a communicating horn or an uncommunicating horn. So sometimes there can be a component of... of um, the menstrual flow cannot actually can come out of one side, but can't come out because it's not connected to the vagina on the other side. So these can swell and cause pain. 
Um, sometimes it'll start off as just causing pain each month, but then over time, as that um, blood ret is retained within that horn and has nowhere to go, it can lead to constant pelvic pain, right? And can be quite debilitating. Um, and if these things aren't thought about and recognized, you can imagine the story can go on for quite a while. Um, and so understanding some of those things are important. Um, but yeah, something to be understood um, about, about your, like not every, and young women who have renal issues, um, well, quite commonly, because your kidneys develop along with your uterus. So they all quite commonly have an associated um, uterine anomaly. So important that they're getting evaluated. And I think most um, renal specialists are aware of this association. So they'll quite commonly refer to us um, to make sure that that piece is also being addressed. Um, yeah, childhood cancer survivors, you know, it's really important that their reproductive needs are addressed early in life too, um, just to make sure that they haven't had any sequelae from their cancer treatments. And if they have that, you know, they're getting um, their hormones replaced so they can undergo, you know, normal puberty development too. And also just to make sure that we're optimizing their reproductive outcomes for later in life. Um, and their fertility outcomes, right? So all of those things are, you know, areas and spaces that there's been tremendous growth and development in. And I hope to see just us, like as a field becoming more and more proactive in, in meeting those needs. So as pediatric and adolescent gynecologists, I think we see, you know, some very complex gynecological issues, but then also on the other end of the spectrum, some relatively straightforward things too, right? And everything in between. It's like the same reasons adults go to see, um, you know, gynecologists, but we don't have multiple subspecialists within our field, right? Um, so, you know, we kind of take care of it all. And then, yeah, you're right. Young women with cysts, um, you know, traditionally some of them will see adult gynecologists to get those taken care of or pediatric surgeons. And then we're sort of in the mix as well, where we exist, we'll often take care of it and then helping to provide guidance and how these should be managed with the with a teen lens, as opposed to with an adult lens, because the pathology is often quite different, right? So we want to do everything to preserve ovaries and, and make sure that, um, you know, that we're optimizing, you know, reproductive function and preserving things for the future. Yeah. This is amazing. Thank you so much. I, I learned so much from you. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. Yes. This is incredible. I feel like, yeah. And oh. I, I think everyone who's listening will love this so much too, because like we talked about, this is, it feels like a burgeoning field and it it's really just going to just explode. I'm sure over the coming years. And um, I would love for you to just share with everyone where people can find you. I imagine you said you have people coming from all over the state. So maybe there are people who come from outside of Florida too, to see you. I, I totally would if I had a daughter. <laughs> well, I'm happy to say, I think we exist in most states now. It's been a big mission of pediatric and adolescent gynecology. And I think most academic centers um, are also, you know, value the role of a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist. So I think, you know, reaching out to your local one to figure out who's taking care. Um, and then, like I mentioned, NASPAG website, find a PAG doc, you'll find us there. And then I'm in Florida. So I'm in Orlando. I have my own private practice, the GYN space, which provides virtual care throughout the state. Um, that was just a recent change for me. I was previously with a larger health organization, but I just kind of wanted to do this a little differently. So started my own practice. So you can find me there. You can go to my website. Um, you can find me on Instagram, follow. If there's topics you want me to talk about, I'm happy to, or put up a post about something. I'm happy to do that and just spread <laughs> the knowledge because it, it's key, right? It certainly is. Maggie, yeah. thank you so much. This was amazing. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me on and for, you know, putting, you know, the 
the GYN needs of tweens, teens, and young adults, like front and center, right? Always. I'm, yeah, I'm here for it <laughs> forever. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. That's a wrap. Be sure to click that subscribe button to join me for more Girl Talk Gone Menstrual in upcoming episodes. But in the meantime, check out my latest period party episode. And if you're looking for a deeper dive into your hormones, go ahead and take my period quiz at nicolejardim.com quiz.